Once upon a time, there was a land called Harmonious Song. Harmonious Song was in fact the oldest of all the world's countries, the very first land to rise up out of the sea and rock. There the gods first taught humans to shelter themselves, and which plants were good to eat, and later, how to follow the endless dance and battles of the stars and planets. The people of the land called themselves singers, or Harmony's children. For many thousands of years they lived in peace and prosperity, with one group after another building their temples and palaces and monuments on the rubble of ones who has gone before. And then, one day, in the season when the morning stars enter the great houses of the heavens, and people knew it is time to set their seeds in the ground, a huge fleet of black ships sailed into the harbor of Harmonious Song, and out of them poured soldiers, an endless swarm of them with thick armor and hard faces and terrible weapons. They called themselves the Army of Love, for their masters had assured them that everything they did was done in the cause of goodness. All the burnt homes, the dead, the tortured, the stolen wealth and beauty, their country called itself chosen, and declared on all its banners, its money, and its engines of death, the blasphemous slogan, Beloved of God. Harmony's children did their best to fight back against the army of love, but they might just as well have been babies caught in a sandstorm. Many years passed, generations in fact, and the people of Harmonious Song suffered and suffered. One day, a woman who lived in a straw shack, as did many others, gave birth to a loud baby boy who wailed and waved his tiny fists as if he was going to grab some treasure from the very air. It would have to be from the air, for the poor woman owned nothing, nothing at all. Nevertheless, she was happy to hear his cries and to see him clutch the air as if he could pull down the sky. She'd given birth to five children before this one, and none of them had lasted more than a week. This one, she thought, would fight back against the hunger and sorrow. This one will grow strong and do great things. She named him Hunger for More, and instead of lullabies, would whisper to him stories of all the wonders he would perform and the wealth he would acquire, and how the whole world would love him. But alas, in the country of Harmonious Song, even a child named Hunger for More could find little opportunity to survive, let alone become rich. He grew up strong and handsome, with a quick mind and nimble hands, but when his mother brought him to craftsmen or merchants and begged them to take the boy as an apprentice, none would have him, for they needed a place for their own children. Finally the poor woman died, and the boy, desperate to live, resorted to the lowest of all trades. He became a pickpocket. For several years, Hunger for More made his meager way in the world. He was quick and clever, and no one ever caught him, and so he had made enough money for food and clothing, and sometimes a warm room for the night. But he was not happy, for what would his mother think if she knew that he had betrayed all of her ambitions for him? One day, he picked a traveler's wallet and discovered a letter. Now, this had happened before, and usually Hungry for More would not read a word, but make sure to leave the letter and wallet somewhere a diligent search might recover them. But this time, he held the paper. His fingers tingled, and the more he tried to resist, the more he could not turn his eyes away. After all, he told himself his mother had gone to great lengths to find someone who would teach him to read, should he waste such a hard-won ability. To his amazement, the letter spoke of a certain figure, whom Hungry for More had heard about, but never believed was real. She was called the Old Woman of Silver Caves, and if indeed she was real, she was the carrier of a tradition so ancient, even the temple archives could not describe its beginnings. The old women were healers, and keepers of the wisdom of the plants and animals, but most of all, at least as far as Hungry for More was concerned, they were oracles. If you could find your way to her, she could see directly into the hidden depths of your soul. And not only did the letter speak of her, it actually described the difficult journey to find her. The letter was sad, for the writer wrote that he had failed. The way was too hard, and he had to turn back. And yet it spoke with great confidence of the path to the oracle. Hungry for more read the letter three times to memorize it, and then tore it into very small pieces. It was good, he thought, that he had stolen it, for what if the foolish man had kept it in his wallet and been accosted for some curious officer of the army of love? 
Fate had chosen him, he decided, to rescue the letter and its precious information. In fact, maybe the gods had made him a pickpocket for just this moment. And if indeed he had fulfilled his destiny as a snatcher of wallets, then maybe he was free, or some greater purpose would unfold itself. And who better to reveal such a truth than the very oracle whose secret he had helped preserve? Within the money he had taken from the wallet, Hungry for More took a room at an inn and ordered a luxurious meal. The next day, he set out on his journey. He traveled nine days through forests and deserts, over mountains and rivers, until at last he came to a tiny cave entrance hidden in a neck of bleak and lifeless hills. With a small torch, he followed a winding path deep into the ground. It became very cold, and the tunnel became so low and narrow, he had to turn sideways and bend at his knees to keep going. His torch went out, but a silvery light filled the air, just enough that he could see the walls. They were rough and sharp, and if he just brushed against them, they would have scraped the skin and meat right off his bones. This is terrible, he thought. He could hardly breathe with the walls so close like this. He would have to turn back. He had no choice. But then he remembered his mother, and all she had done to help him make his way into the world. He breathed very shallowly, so as not to expand his chest against the sharp rocks, but he continued. Finally, just as he thought he must certainly die in that wretched passage, he saw a light, and when he turned to bend, the tunnel finally ended, and he emerged into a perfectly little valley. The sun shone on a stream with sparkly water. Trees hung heavy with fruit, wildflowers of every color covered the ground, and a sweet smell filled the air. In the center stood a small wooden house. It looked very old, the wood all discolored into subtle shades of blue and red, but it appeared strong, too, as if it stood there forever and would stand forevermore. A white cow and a pair of black sheep grazed happily in the house. Hungry for more strode past them with a cheerful wave. But as he got closer, he discovered more fearful guardians. Green snakes slithered toward him through the flowers, their mouths open to show their sharp fangs. Hungry for more looked all around until he spotted a gnarly branch that had fallen from one of the trees. Quickly, he grabbed it and waved it low to the ground. The snakes stopped, stared at it convinced the stick was their king, and when he tossed it to the side, they all swarmed off after it. Hungry for more stepped forward, only to discover a large red wolf right in front of him. It growled and rumbled, and flecks of foam dripped from its teeth. Hungry for more shook with fear, and he wanted to turn and run for the tunnel, but instead, he began to wiggle his quick fingers like a dancer in front of the wolf's eyes. "'Aren't you something?' he said gently. "'What a beautiful creature you are!' His gra the wolf stopped his growling as he stared at the elegant fingers. Hungry for more reached out and stroked him. The wolf sat back amongst the flowers and closed his eyes. Good puppy, Hungry for more said, and smothered the wolf's fur before he moved on. Well, 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 a voice said. A visitor. How lovely. Hungry for more walked around the corner of the house, and there... In a yellow rocking chair sat an old woman. She wore a dark blue dress that seemed too large for her narrow body. The skin on her face and neck and hands were covered in tiny lines and had been stretched so thin that it seemed the sun could shine right through it and light up her delicate bones. She was knitting, a shawl that filled her lap with the images of a night sky, for the wool was dark and glistening, with sparkling dots and swirls that mimicked the stars in the Milky Way. The needles were gold and silver. They moved so fast they sounded like crickets on a summer night. She glanced at Hungry for more for just a moment, the way someone might look at a flicker of a fire just barely visible in the far horizon. Then she returned to the click-click of her knitting. She said, It's clearly been a long time since anyone's been kind enough to visit us. Hungry for more bowed awkwardly. Great mother of wisdom, he said, I come to you... I come to you a weary seeker, uh, blown across the world like dirt. I beg for your guidance. He would practiced this speech many times, only to feel foolish in the actual moment of telling it. She smiled slightly and said, That certainly sounds troublesome. And you do seem like a nice young man. My animals like you. We must always trust the animals. How can I help you? I seek my true work in the world. 
do you? And what work do you do now? Uh, uh, to my great eternal shame, I am a pickpocket. She made a noise. Pickpocket? No, no, that is not a profession. For someone as smart and talented as you. Hope sparkled and hung you for more's face like the stars in the old woman's shawl. Then tell me. Tell me my destiny. What, what should I become? A thief. What? She was making fun of him. He wanted to grab her shoulders, shake her, yank her from the chair. She, he took a deep breath to control himself. As if she didn't notice his fury, she simply said, You must give up the life of a pickpocket and become a thief. Hungry for more sighed. Maybe she was right. Maybe thief was all he was good for. And yes, it would at least be an improvement on pickpocket. And so he bowed once more. Thank you, grandmother, for your wisdom and made his weary way back to the tunnel. Now he no longer lifted wallets, but instead stole valuable objects, such as golden cups or jeweled necklaces from wherever some poor innocent might have left them, vulnerable to his quick hands. To tell the truth, it was very rare that something so precious as a necklace came his way. Mostly he stole such insignificant items as a pair of boots left outside a door, or a chicken unattended at the side of the market. Nevertheless, he did well and soon he could afford a small house at the edge of the woods. He no longer slept to forget hunger, and even had a warm bed in his warm little home. But still, he could not bear the thought of what his mother might say if she saw him at his work. So after some time, he made his way back to the tunnel, back to the worn cabin in the valley. This time he brought honey bread to distract the snakes, and a lovely piece of raw goat for the wolf. Wise grandmother, he said to the woman, who sat in her chair and knitted her shawl, which now tumbled over her lap to the ground. I followed your guidance and became a thief, and I have to admit that, yes, I have done well, but my heart is still troubled. She glanced at him, the way someone might look at a fire that burns brightly in the distance. Thief, she said. Well, of course you're troubled. That is not the profession for a young man so clever and resourceful. Then tell me, he said, what should I become? A burglar. As Hungry for More threw up his hands, the woman said, You can hardly just wait for someone to leave things out for you. Yes, this is my advice to you. Become a burglar. Hungry for More lowered his head. Thank you, grandmother, he said, nearly in tears. Once again he returned to the world, and now he broke into homes at night. Homes of merchants on their travels, or rich people who'd gone to country houses, or people who'd gone off to visit friends, never suspecting that they would return to a ransacked home, with all their valuables vanished into a burglar's bag. Hungry for more discovered that he was good at such work. He taught himself to pick locks, and even break windows without making any noise. He quickly learned all the secret places which ri he quickly learned all the places where rich people hid their jewels or money. He bought himself a bigger house and furnished it with fine wooden chairs and a carved bed. When he went to sell his stolen goods and met the master thief's beautiful daughter, he realized for the first time in his life he had enough money to think of a family. One night he was throwing silver spoons and knives into his sack when a voice behind him ordered, Drop everything and don't move. He turned and there in a long, embroidered nightshirt stood the owner of the house with a sword extended to within a foot of Hungry for More's chest. The burglar stared at the sword tip, and the gloating face of the man he was sure had left the city with a caravan of mules. The man said, Now you'll learn what happens when you steal from innocent citizens. Fury overwhelmed Hungry for More's fear. Innocent? Innocent? How dare this pompous fool who cheated people every day of his life, who became rich trading with the army of love, how dare he denounce a poor burglar who just wanted to make his way in the world? He crouched down, then sprung forward to butt his head against the man's belly. With a loud noise, the merchant dropped the sword and staggered backwards. Hungry for more, grabbed the weapon, and in a moment... 
had the tip of it against the man's throat. His breath came in great gusts, and he was about to pierce the skin and watch the man's life spurt into the air, when suddenly his mother's sad face appeared on his mind. He threw the sword against the far wall and ran from the house. The next day he set off for the old woman. Grandmother, he said as she sat peacefully and worked at her shawl, please help me. I followed your advice and became a thief, and then a burglar. Is this really my destiny? Just before I came here, I almost killed a man. Please, tell me, what should I do? She looked at him for several moments now. The way someone might look at a fire that consumes an entire hillside. Then she went back to her knitting. The gold and silver needles, like lightning, as they added more darkness and stars to the long shawl. Become a bandit, she said. What? A bandit. A robber. Someone who jumps out. I know what a bandit is. Good. I was wondering about you for a moment. But a burglar is bad enough. Exactly, she said. Sneaking around in darkness, snatching whatever people have left behind. That is certainly no life for someone as brave and intelligent as you. Bandit. That is what you must do. And she returned to her knitting, as serene as if she sat all alone amongst the wildflowers, with only the sheep and cow, the snakes, and the wolf to keep her company. With a deep sigh, hungry for more, returned to the tunnel. When he arrived home, he went straight to the house of the master thief, where the daughter smiled slyly at him as she served wine and cakes. He bought himself a good strong sword and a pair of pistols engraved with pictures of ancient heroes. For several days, he practiced jumping from behind trees or giant rocks. He would wave his weapon at the air, try to hold a menacing posture, try to speak in a deep and commanding voice. Finally, he knew he must either do it or deny what the woman had told him. And somehow, even though he hated the destiny she'd given him, and hoped his mother lay beyond all knowledge of it. He could not bring himself to ignore what the oracle had told him. And so, on a moonless night, he took a piece of blue cloth, cut out eye holes, and tied it around his upper face for a mask. Then he waited behind a dense clump of trees until he saw a pair of merchants wending their way home from a party. He jumped into the road with his arms straight out so that the pistols came to within inches of their faces. Stop! he cried. Give me everything you have or die in the dirt. It was not such a good speech, he thought, but it was the best that he could think of. And it worked. The terrified merchants dropped their wallets, their rings, their various trinkets, and probably would have taken off their clothes if Hungry for More had not waved them on their way. As he swept his prizes into a plain blue sack, he tried not to think of the shame his mother would have felt at the sight of those two frightened fools with pistols, his pistols, pointed right at their eyes, and yet he could not deny a strange thrill that surged through him. The old woman was right. He'd hated always hiding, never daring to confront the people whose property he stole. He laughed. If he must live as a thief in this corrupt world, then let him do so openly. He remembered suddenly how his mother had taken him from place to place, begging every merchant and tradesman to give him honest work, and no one had helped them there. Very well, then, he thought. Bandit, it is. And so he began to pray on the countryside. The blue mask, they called him, for the cloth he wore over his face. Merchants, nobles, even government officials, nobody was safe from him. Though sometimes the purses he stole were in fact less than he might have gotten as a burglar. He pursued this new life with much more enthusiasm, and soon he was able to build himself a fine house and give money to the poor. And when he asked the daughter of the Master of Thieves to marry him, she threw herself around him, and in a voice filled with tears, told him that she was the happiest woman in the sad land of Harmonious Song. One night, he was hiding behind a thick tree when he spotted a pair of wealthy lords nervously looking all around as they hurried along the road. But when he jumped out and waved his pistols at them, they only laughed. They threw off their cloaks and stood, revealed in their uniforms as soldiers of the army of love. 
In their flat, dead accents, they said, Now, you rag-headed piece of harmonious garbage, you're going to get what you deserve. And maybe the rest of your filthy countrymen will learn a lesson. Hungry for more, fired his pistols, but they had already jumped to the side and taken out their own guns, bigger and more powerful than anything a lowly robber could hope to acquire. Hungry for more dropped to the left, just as high-speed bullets whined past him. He knew they expected him to run, or try to fight both of them at once, so instead, he crouched low and charged directly at the taller and stronger of the two soldiers. While the other stood there, afraid to fire for fear he would hit his friend, the soldier under attack tried to aim his gun. Hungry for more slit the man's throat with a silver-handled dagger his wife had given him as a wedding present. In almost the same motion, he flung the dead man's body at the other soldier. Before the frightened man could get up onto his feet, Hungry for more shot him in the face. He stepped back now to lean against a tree, too weak to stand. He'd just killed two men. More, he'd killed two soldiers from the terrible army of love, something no child of Harmonious Song had ever done in over a hundred years. He was not sure if he felt ashamed or exhilarated as he walked to a nearby stream and washed the blood from his face and hands. After that, Hungry for More became even more clever and fearless. After that, Hungry for More became even more clever and fearless. He evaded trap after trap, but when he could not do anything but stand and fight, he attacked with such ferocity that no one could resist him. Then one day, he came home to his wife, unable to stop trembling. When she asked him what disturbed him so deeply, he told her that when he stepped from hiding to rob a rich aristocrat, traveling with his family, the wretched man had begged and begged Blue Mask to kill only him and allow his wife and babies to survive. Is this what I've become? he asked his wife. A ghost of death to terrify helpless people? Go see the old woman, she told him. Maybe she can reveal a deeper truth. And so, once again, Hungry for More crossed the desert and mountains, the forest and river, and held his breath as he squeezed through the cave. Once again, he petted the sheep and the cow, gave treats to the snakes, and the wolf who now greeted him as a dear friend. How nice to see you again, the old woman said. Her gold and silver knitting needles moved so fast that Hungry for More could hardly follow them. The shawl now covered the ground all around her feet. Please, he said. I was a pickpocket, and you told me to become a thief. I was a thief, and you told me to become a burglar. And then I was a burglar, and you told me to become a robber. Now the very sight of me terrifies people who have never done me the slightest harm. Is this really my destiny? Her needles slowed as she looked up at him. She stared at him intently now. The way that someone looks at a fire that rages across the countryside. Finally she said, No. No, I, I can see that you are brave and strong and really quite a fine bandit. But there's a whole countryside to rob, and you could hardly do it all yourself. He stared at her. I'm sorry, wise mother, but I do not understand you. Really? It's not that complicated. Here's what you must do. Choose five men who are brave, resourceful, and clever, just like yourself. Train them in the ways of the bandit. I'm sure you know much more about that than I do. When they have proven themselves, tell each of them to train five more, and each of those to train another five, and let them all wear blue masks so that everyone knows they belong to you, and follow your will. And when you've done all that, well, then you really have made some progress. Hungry for more could only stare at her, his mouth open. She glanced up as if surprised he was still there. Well, go on. There's no reason to waste your time. There's really no time to waste, you know. 
wearily. Hungry for more made his way back through the tunnel and across the countryside to where his wife waited for him. He could hardly keep tears from his voice as he told her his new destiny. But his wife stroked his hair and his cheeks, and she kissed him, and she said, Now don't worry. If the old woman tells you to do this, then of course you must do it. Hasn't she always been good to us? Without her help, we never would have met. You would still be a pickpocket if, indeed, you'd even survived so long. And so, with the help of his wife and his father-in-law, Hungry for More selected five men, strong and fearless and smart. Carefully, he taught them to fight and plan and escape traps whenever possible, and then he sent them out into the world. Years passed. The brigades of the Blue Mask roamed the countryside at will stealing from lords and merchants and, ta and tax collectors. They'd long ago lost track of how many men they'd killed. They'd long ago lost track of how many men they'd killed. Soldiers, private guards, men who wanted to prove themselves, or simply the greedy rich who could not bear the thought of life without their money. Hungry for more and his wife lived in a large but simple house, their only indulgence a small collection of carvings from long ago years before the army of love had conquered their country and banned everything harmonious. The rest of their money they gave to the poor and the families of any bandit who were killed or caught. But still, he was troubled. One day, he and two of his lieutenants stopped a small caravan of tax officials and their families. The soldiers ran in fear and the men nearly threw their money at the robbers while the wives crouched down in their carriage. Only an elderly woman stood her ground. She held her cane tightly in both hands and said to the bandits, What have you done with your life? What kind of man doesn't dare to show his face to the world? Do you think your mother is proud of you? One of the robbers raised his pistols at her, but hungry for more slapped his hand away. The old woman only laughed. Over the next nights, hungry for more found it impossible to sleep. All night he turned in his bed, but every time he closed his eyes he imagined he could hear that old woman laughing. Finally his wife took his face in her hands and said to him, Why should you feel such shame? You have only ever done what the oracle told you to do. Go. Ask her the meaning of it, or we will never have any peace. Once again Hungry for More made the great journey. He traveled across the wetlands and the forests. He squeezed his way between the razor-sharp walls of the cave until he emerged once again in the hidden valley. The two black sheep and the white cow stopped their grazing and followed him. Even the snakes and wolf ignored the delicacies he brought for them in order to slither or walk alongside him. Wise mother, he said to her as she knitted her shawl that poured out from the yellow chair like some vast lake of darkness and stars. I have done all that you have told me. I became a thief, a burglar, a bandit. Now I rule a great force of bandits, and no one may travel the roads or the woods unless I allow it. But I am pained. Is this all my life will ever mean? Please, tell me. I have always followed your words. What must I do now? Now, she said. She tied the end of her massive shawl and dropped the gold and silver needles to the ground. Hungry for more, felt the earth shudder beneath him. The old woman turned to face him. She folded her hands in her lap and stared at him a long, long time. The way one stares at a fire that burns the end of the world. And now? And now? Now? She said. But her voice had changed, becoming younger, stronger. And then she stood up. And as she did so, the years fell away like water, and she became young and beautiful and terrifying. With one hand, she flung the great shawl behind her, and it filled the sky, dark and glistening, alive with rivers of stars. Now? Now, she said in a voice cold and hardened as the winter's night. You and your invincible bandits will rise up and drive the army of love from every speck and corner of the sacred land. 
and so they did. They fought for seven years, and after that the invaders who had ruled so cruelly so many generations finally sailed away in their dark boats. The land of harmonious song once more became free, and hungry for more became its king. As Destiny the First, he ruled for many years with his wife beside him, both of them beloved for their wisdom and compassion. When the queen finally died, Destiny left his throne, never to be seen again. Some say he never died, but lives forever, with an old woman, a pair of black sheep, a white cow, a nest of green snakes, and a ferocious red wolf. But others claim he travels the heavens, where he robs the very stars, so that he can pour light down upon a dark and hungry world.